If you can come a bit closer, yeah, why not? It will make it more cozy. My name is Peter Boyle. I'm the uh, MC for today's event. Uh, I don't know why they picked me. I'm an Australian Malaysian. I have been a strong interest, of course, in, uh, in particularly in the new democracy movement that is sweeping Malaysia and, and many other places, and been involved with the Berset activities. But I think mainly they picked me because I'm what they call the Chakabanya pick me up, you know, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> I'm a journalist yeah, so activist right. by profession, and I, I have a strong interest as we, in, in the discussion we have here today. Uh, but uh, before we start today's proceedings, and I will just describe to you after this very briefly what we're doing here, the, the, the basic content of this program, I would like to acknowledge that uh, this event is, is, is happening on, uh, on, on Aboriginal land, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And we pay our respects to the elders past and present. Now, basically, the format that we are following today is, is read, basically there's two halves. Uh, before you, uh, you have a, a set of panelists, we'll have a panel discussion which will go for roughly an hour. And then after that, we are showing two films, two documentary films, you know, among many uh, interesting documentaries that have come out from Malaysia recently, just part and parcel of the cultural and political aspect of the great transformations, democratic transformations taking place there. And after that, we will have uh, another discussion. So we're having two sets of discussions, roughly cut in the middle. The second part of the discussions will be about the films, and we'll be hooking up so classically through the internet with um, uh, um, two of the directors of these films. So you can talk to them, ask them questions. Now, this is going to be a very interactive thing. We'll be asking you to talk and ask the questions. You'll be directing the people on the front. Won't be speaking at great length. They are here to answer some of your questions, to have a dialogue with you. But before we go any further, I want to introduce Adrian Leon, just a, uh, who is from John Undi, which is the subgroup or subcommittee of the Berse Sydney that has put on this event to explain what John Undi is. that a group of us uh, in Sydney have organized. Uh, it's called uh, Jong Balik Undi. And for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, the Malay term, it means uh, let's go home and vote. And the purpose of Jong Balik Undi uh, is, to, is to encourage Malaysians overseas, anyone who qualifies to vote in Mal the Malaysian elections, to please fly home to vote in the 13 general elections that will take place uh, any time within between now and uh, June 28th is the absolute latest uh, legal date which it can be held. And cast your vote to vote for uh, a brighter, cleaner and brighter future for all Malaysians. And now why are we putting out this uh, summon out to all Malaysians? There are three reasons. First reason of all is that GE13 is critical. This is our best chance to ensure a brighter and cleaner future for all Malaysians. And secondly, every vote counts. Uh, we want to uh, change people's minds that their, their votes are not, uh, cannot make a difference because it certainly can. And we want them to go home and exercise their vote for change in Malaysia. And thirdly, uh, by ensuring the highest number of Malaysians voting at home, on home soil, we can minimize electoral fraud in, in the form of phantom voters, uh, and other people using up uh, their vote to cast the vote on their behalf. Uh, and as per Berset's own call, it says, Kura mengundi lawan penipuan, which means, come out and vote, to we'll fight the fraud. <coughs> and so, how did we send this message out to Malaysians all over the world? Uh, we set up a Facebook page called Jom Balik Undi Malaysia. And uh, <coughs> on this Facebook page, we urge people from all over the world to please Send us photographs of your mess of yourself holding your personal message of hope and change for Malaysia. And Malaysians from all over the world responded. Malaysians from Australia responded. Malaysians from North America responded. Malaysians from Europe responded. In the Middle East and South Africa, uh, and, and Africa, in India, in East Asia, 
in Malaysia, Singapore, and throughout Southeast Asia as well. And these are the results of the photographs that they have uh, submitted to us.
No, Adrian is, uh, is, I think, symbolic of uh, a very important part of the process that Malaysia is going through now. Is a younger generation that's stepping forward to speak out and to 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 activate, not just talk about things, complain about things, but to do something about it. She has been a researcher um, for ministers in the in the Selangor State Government for a while, and has been a student overseas in Japan for a while. And she happened to be in. Japan during the time of the Bursay 3 mobilizations and promptly organized uh, Bursay 3 in Japan. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, that gives us a lot of hope for the future. Now, there is an interruption to the program, sorry, but uh, it's a very important, before we start the, the formal panel, we have a surprise guest speaker. Uh, and the guest speaker is from Malaysia. It is Ambiga, Ambiga Srinivasan from the co-chair of Verse, which is the very important civil society movement that has organized uh, the, all the Verse rallies and has really played a critical role in, in the process of change that is taking place. And for her efforts, uh, Ambiga has suffered a lot of abuse, including the staging of a bare buttocks protest outside a private residence, and recently former um, uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mah uh, Mahathir, called for her to be stripped of Malaysian citizenship. Nevertheless, hundreds of thousands have joined her in the various public uh, rallies calling for electoral reform and for clean and fair elections. And her counterpart at the helm of Berse is the National Poet Laureate, A. Samad Said. And Ambiga, I should say, uh, is, was, is a lawyer and was president of the Malaysian Bar Council from 2007 to 2009. So we invited her, typically by uh, high-tech Google, Google, Google Hangout, uh, to say a few words to this audience before we start our uh, uh, panel discussion. Please go ahead. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon to you, it's me. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure if you can see me. Can you see me? Yes. 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 Yes, we can hear you. Wait. Hi. I saw her on the other I think it's frozen. No, no, no. I think the image is good. Sorry. This <laughs> invisible hand. Is it connected now? you all uh, spend an afternoon, um, Saturday afternoon, talking about uh, Malaysian democracy. Uh, you all know what's been happening for the past couple of years. I think um, as far as Berse is concerned, uh, cutting straight to the chase, the um, eight demands of Berse have not really been met. Um, we've had the indelible ink that's been, that they're going to use. The problem with the introduction of the indelible ink is that the process is, is a little bit uh, flawed, we believe. They are proposing to apply the indelible ink before collection of the ballot paper. And that to me is rather unusual because you would normally apply the indelible ink after the person votes. So we have concerns that if it's applied before the ballot is collected, it may, um, you may smudge the ballot, it could be a spoiled vote. So we have concerns like that, that we, uh, about the indelible ink. Apart from that is the overseas vote that they um, have at the very last minute introduced. We are very annoyed actually about the condition that they have imposed. We don't think it's constitutional. What they have done is they've imposed a condition of five years and um, uh, saying that you have to return to the country for 30 days, a period of 30 days, uh, and to be eligible to be a posted overseas voter. 
The problem with that is we're about one month away from the elections. Now, if, if there are people who have not fulfilled this condition, you're giving them no time at all to be able to fulfill that condition. And, and to me, the way they unilaterally imposed this condition, there was no discussion, there was nothing, uh, is unacceptable. We have raised these concerns. Of course, raising concerns with the Election Commission is completely pointless. It's complete, completely pointless at this point, uh, and has been so actually for, for a while. So that's, that's the problem with the uh, uh, overseas votes. Now, we still have concerns about the postal votes. We still have concerns about the electoral roll. Very recently, and this was uh, uh, earlier, th uh, earlier this week, the Slango state government, uh, the Mantri Basar, the chief minister, came out and said that they had done their own survey of the electoral roll and of 500,000 new voters, they were unable to trace 28% of those voters. Now, so you're looking at about 150,000 people. There may be legitimate reasons for that, but the election commission is just not responding. They don't even want to meet them. So looking at the conduct of the election commission, I have a grave disquiet about what's gonna happen in Slango. Don't forget, Slango is a hot state. Uh, the Barisan National wants Slango back. So we are anticipating a lot of problems in Slango. And there you have it. You have these unexplained voters. As I say, there may be good reasons, but our concern is why is the EC not taking steps to reassure the Slango state government that these are legitimate voters? So, and, and it's not just that. If you've been following the Sabah Royal Commission of Inquiry, you will see that there's a lot of evidence coming out about how uh, um, uh, foreigners have been given citizenship for votes. Um, it's actually spine chilling, I've called it spine chilling, the evidence that's coming out. So Project IC, which everyone suspected has been happening, now we have evidence that it did. And of course, this has been going on for years and years and years. So, and we suspect it's happening here, in West Malaysia, recently, a newspaper broke a story about five Pakistanis who bought their uh, identity cards in Sabah and have voted in the last five elections. They have a Malaysian passport and they go back to see their family in Pakistan using the Malaysian passport. And they have jobs in Malaysia. So this is not something new. And this is something we're hearing um, uh, stories about every day. We're getting reports constantly that there is a registration of foreigners going on. So all in all, our biggest, biggest concern right now is the cleanliness of the electoral role. And I'm afraid that the EC has shown, has not shown um, independence at all. The other thing that is very worrying recently is the um, events of political violence. Uh, I don't know if you have read, but on, um, I think it was Friday or, or Thursday, uh, when uh, the opposition leader went to give a, a talk in Malacca, they were confronted yet again by uh, about a hundred um, uh, thugs, actually, who tried to disrupt the uh, proceedings. Uh, a pers one person got hurt because stones were hurled, a window was broken in the vehicle that the uh, party was using, and so on and so forth. Now, this is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the fifth or sixth incident of political violence and it keeps going on it keeps going on and um, the government is doing nothing to arrest this trend uh, recently the prime minister signed the transparency international oath uh, integrity pledge as it were pledging that they would behave or he would uh, act ethically in these elections and he came out and said it was important for him to sign this pledge because he has to set the tone for the elections. Well, the first thing the Prime Minister ought to have done was to have come out and condemned this political violence because that's hardly ethical. But that's not happening. So there are a lot of very worrying trends going on uh, at the moment. And I have grave doubts that these elections are going to be completely free and fair. In fact, I'm, I'm positive they're not going to be completely free and fair, uh, which is why Bursay has its own project. We have started a citizen observers uh, project and we're going to observe the elections ourselves. But of course, being citizen observers, we don't have access 
into the polling stations, we will be outside and we will do our best because we've decided to monitor this ourselves. They're not going to call uh, international observers. As far as the other demands are concerned, because of what I've said uh, uh, just now, and we none of them have been fulfilled. Uh, we don't think they're going to be strict about electoral violences, uh, electoral offences. Um, uh, and I think uh, that's something that's, that we've been complaining about for a long time. We think there will be vote buying. So we think we're going to see a lot of this going on, but the only way we can counter it is for us ourselves to be vigilant. Um, I'll stop there and I will take questions. I, I don't know if that's permissible at this stage. I don't know how what the program is, but I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I, I think I think Dr. Mambiga, we we are we need to start the panelists to come into our yeah. story first, and if you can hang around for a little bit, you could be okay. part of the discussion. But if you are busy, Sorry. then please, okay? No problem. Okay. I let you know. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay, so now we will start to move into the, the panel discussion and um, what, are, what we're going to do is uh, give each panelist a couple of minutes first to, to, to say a few words. Uh, in most cases, uh, for the Australian panelists here, it is, uh, we, we hope they will tell us their, their connection with the Malaysian democracy movement. I mean, they are an interesting gang here. But before I, I, uh, I, I introduce the Australian, uh, well, the, 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 the guest here, I want to introduce one more person who has been part of the organizing, and that's William de Cruz, who's uh, a journalist from Malaysia originally, and now living here, and a musician who has helped organize the movement here. Um, and uh, he's going to say a few words about uh, Bursay Sydney and uh, its, its, uh, its outlook. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysians, friends of Malaysia, and my esteemed fellow panel members, Governments the world over are quick to describe my country, Malaysia, as a robust democracy. I'm here today to challenge that very notion on behalf of Berse, the NGO that has led the fight for comprehensive and sweeping reform of the election system in Malaysia. Berse has chosen to define democracy by one of its fundamental building blocks. For Berse, the most critical brick in the wall is an election process that meets universal standards of accountability, transparency, and legitimacy. For more than 55 years now, nation building in Malaysia has not been privileged to rest on any such legitimate system. The system is ridden by a litany of fraud, deceit, manipulation, and gerrymandering, and it is managed by an election commission that has blocked any attempt at meaningful reform. Under the tutelage of successive prime ministers, beginning with Malaysia's longest serving premier, Mahathir Mom, excuse me, the election commission has turned recalcitrance into an art form. For Malaysia's voting system, the election commission has also designed a unique form of disproportionate misrepresentation in the Dewan Raya, our parliament. Of the nearly 8 million votes counted in the last election held in 2008, the incumbent government secured 3.6% more votes than the opposition. But this translated to a 26.1% parliamentary majority due to delineation of electoral boundaries. And in Australia, we like to refer to that quite openly as gerrymandering. Nevertheless, at the same election, the ruling coalition's two-thirds parliamentary majority was broken by the opposition for the first time since 1957. Until 2008, and for 55 years, the government was able to rewrite Malaysia's constitution at will. These spectacular failures of Malaysia's electoral system, and there are many more that I could list, are the focus of Bursay's fight as the country approaches its critical 13th general election. Bursay believes that democracy must always begin with the vote and that the individual vote must be lodged within a secure and legitimate electoral system. 
and that this system must be able to properly and fairly measure the collective will of the country's citizens in the election. Berse believes that only such a venture can deliver to the winning party the constitutional mandate to govern Malaysia and guarantee a two-party system that will hold any government, any government, accountable to the people through the parliamentary representatives that they would vote. A robust democracy in Malaysia, therefore, can only stem from that vote held sacred within a fair and proper election system. This is Bursay's demand for Malaysia. This is Bursay's dream. My friends and I in Bursay, Sydney and Jombale, Undi work towards that dream today and we all hope and pray that Malaysia may one day very soon awaken to that very dream. Thank you. Thank you, thank you William. Now I'd like to introduce our next uh, panelist. And this is uh, Senator Nick Xenophon, independent senator for South Australia. Now he has been outspoken on many issues. He's probably among Australians most famous for speaking out against the pokies, gambling, and Church of Scientology. But recently, he was uh, detained and when he was trying to enter Malaysia and deported. So I'd be better let him tell the story. <laughs> you know, were you trying to smuggle guns in or something? No, I, I think there's some, thank you, Pete. I, I think there's some irony that they'll let someone from Hamas, which is a uh, acknowledged terrorist organization into Malaysia, but not, not me. Um, the irony was that I was supposed to be part of a delegation of members of both the Liberal Party, the National Party and the, and the ALP to go into Malaysia and I arrived a day early ahead of my colleagues and the agreement was it was supposed to be a low-key visit. The leader of the delegation was going to be um, uh, Dr Mal Washer, a Liberal MP from Western Australia and we, you probably wouldn't have known about the trip. We were due to meet the Electro Election Commission, due to meet Ambiga. Uh, the opposition leader, Anwar Ibrahim, uh, as well as Minister Nasri. Um, but for some reason, some genius in the Malaysian government thought it was a good idea to deport me, which of course gave the trip a much higher profile than it ever would have had. So, talking about shooting yourself in the foot. So, um, I think that there are some important issues here. I'm very disappointed with the attitude of the Australian government, uh, in particular Foreign Minister Bob Carr. I don't understand why he's taken this view. He's been outspoken about democracy in Burma, in Fiji, uh, in the region generally, but it seems that the Australian government has a blind spot when it comes to Malaysia. Is it because of the people swap deal? I don't know. Bob Carr says that Australia is uh, that Malaysia is a mature democracy. Uses the word mature democracy. Well, cheeses can be mature and they can smell. Uh, so, you know, there's, a real there. there's a real issue there. Well, I think that my involvement in Malaysian in Malaysian issues as, as an Australian MP is an accidental one. I, I met um, the opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim several years ago, back in 2010, in the lead up to his uh, trial, the so-called Sodomy 2 trial. I promised that, I would, that, that we would send an Australian observer to his trial. I'm the only one that was available and that's why I went along. Uh, and I was there when Anwar Ibrahim was acquitted at the beginning of last year, which was quite an uh, electric moment in the courtroom, which was quite unexpected. The, the issue is this, we have strong links with Malaysia. Uh, one of our Governor Generals, Sir William McKill, was actually one of the four jurists that drafted the Malaysian Constitution. We have had hundreds of thousands of Malaysian students that have studied in Malaysia, which is a fantastic and unambiguously good thing. We have strong links. We've just signed a free trade agreement with Malaysia because that's the nature of our relationship. I think it should have been conditional on democratic reform, but I was a minority voice on that. And I think Christine Milne from the Greens had a similar view. I think we um, owe it to Malaysia when Malaysia has asked for our help, when people such as Ambika Srinivasan, who came out to Australia last year, I hosted her with others to speak to MPs, and she was very well received last October. I think we owe it to them, uh, as one of our closest friends, to stand up for them. Uh, there was a letter that Anwar Ibrahim gave me last November to give to Foreign Minister Bob Carr. Basically, the letter said, um, 
Australia, you're one of our last best, best hopes in the region for democracy uh, in Malaysia. You're one of our closest friends. We need your help. Don't let the elections be stolen. Uh, Bob Carr's response to an interview with Sabra Lane on the ABC was quite dismissive. He said, what do you want us to do? Do you want me to send amphibious vehicles to the east coast of Malaysia? It was a stupid, stupid response. So we need to put pressure on the Australian government and also on the opposition to say, you have millions of Malaysians who are looking to Australia to provide constructive help, not to interfere with the elections, but to have independent election observers. Um, and we know the difficulties there. Now, the fatal flaw, if I can finish off on this, the fatal flaw in Bob Carr's argument is that because Australia, because Malaysia has elections and is a so-called mature democracy, therefore we can't intervene. But when you ask Bob Carr, well, what about if the process is fraudulent, if it is um, huge gerrymandering, if there is widespread corruption in the process, do, isn't, doesn't that take away your argument? And he, and he can't seem to answer that. So that's where I think we need to engage with the opposition, with Julie Bishop, the shadow minister, uh, and also to keep asking questions in the, at the federal parliament. But um, I am quite shocked at the response of the Australian government uh, on this, and I think they need to be held to account. We owe it to Malaysians as one of our closest friends to do the right thing, and I think Australia has abandoned a, a clear leadership role it could have had on this. Thank you, Nick. And uh, the next panellist I want to introduce is Jamie Parker. Uh, he's MP for Belmain in New South Wales Legislative uh, Assembly. And, and Jamie has been very helpful for, uh, with those of us who have been campaigning on the Linus issue in particular. And uh, partly because of that, uh, before we held our, our small little support rally in Martin's place uh, earlier this year, during the time of the, the Himpunan Kabangkitan Rakyat, the, the People's Uprising rally, that was held in Kuala Lumpur and drew thousands of th thousands of people. Um, we, I invited Jamie to, to come and address the thing, and he said, "No, I want to go to the <laughs> join the crowd in Kuala Lumpur." He happened to be planning a trip to Burma, and he, he brought it forward and, 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 and went there. So I'm, what I'm most interested in is that how come he managed to get under the radar? <laughs> Jamie, if you stand up. I'm so <laughs> short. <but I'm> <laughs> It's very embarrassing next to him in the demonstration, you have to hold it. <laughs> How did you get in? Well, um, it's a very long story. Um, but uh, what I thought I might do is start by telling that story about how I first became the original question, how I first became involved in this issue. And uh, Nick, you mentioned so many Malaysian students. Well, so many Malaysian, Malaysian students of my generation are now in leadership positions uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and several members. Uh, people will know Elizabeth Wong, yeah. uh, Tian. Those people are people of the generation that I know who are going through university and many others in Malaysia. But the first time I actually visited Malaysia was in 1996. I'd gone to the Immigration Detention Centre in Bangkok because we were trying to get some Burmese activists, pro-democracy activists, out of prison uh, in, in Bangkok. And I also then had the unfortunate pleasure of visiting uh, Pudu Prison. People might know that, Pudu Prison yeah. in Malaysia. For some reason, some Burmese had ended up in Pudu. Um, and what was interesting was the reaction of the Malaysian authorities at that stage. As you know, Mahathir was still in power. Uh, you know, the, the opposition movement still hadn't come to its strength. Um, and there was a very strong arrogance amongst uh, those in government that uh, you know, they were invincible. But history has told us and the most recent election has shown us that that's not the case. So that was my first involvement with Malaysia, but more recently when I was elected to the state parliament, I became very involved in the Linus campaign. I went uh, to Kuantan, and uh, I, while I wasn't invited in, uh, I went around the Linus plant, met with many people, uh, a lot of fishermen and other people in the villages in the area, a lot of environmental activists in particular, and uh, as you heard, I went to the rally in Medeca Stadium. Uh, and for me, uh, one of the big challenges has been uh, seeing the best way that Australia, as a great friend of Malaysia, can support this campaign. And obviously, clean elections, uh, that is the critical uh, approach that we can take. Uh, there is a relationship, of course, between Linus, the Australian company, which I believe is uh, engaging in the disgraceful process for the approval of their plant, and the rare earth processing, which we can talk about later. 
Um, but there is a relationship between Australia and Malaysia, and as we've heard, as great friends, we should be working together. And it's clear to me that the uh, government is incredibly afraid, incredibly afraid, so fearful, in fact, that they are seeking, in my view, to rig the election. And we've seen that uh, just talking to other members of parliament from the opposition, um, that the electoral rolls are being stacked uh, with fake voters, uh, we see foreign voters, and so it's important that we do what we can to increase the vigilance and promote the focus on the election process. I will be seeking to travel to Malaysia to be an election observer, and I'm lucky I've got a few passports. Um, <laughs> and so, that's right. So it helps when you're a British citizen, you're a European citizen, Australian, because you're totally different. That's a different Jamie Parker. Um, so what it means is that there's an opportunity for us to not, 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 not in a confrontational or negative way, not in an aggressive way, not in a way that seeks to criticise the government, but in a way that seeks to recognise that if there are problems and there are, there are illegitimate steps being taken, they need to be resolved. And you know, the best disinfectant is sunlight. And if we can put as much light on this process, we know that we'll get a better result. So I wanted to finish by thanking Peter and everyone who's come here today because there's an incredible opportunity here. This is a key turning point, not just in the history of Malaysia, but also in the history of our region. Because Malaysia is a very important power when it comes to our region. As you know, I'm very involved in the Burma issue. Malaysia is important. It's important that Malaysia represents the voice of its people because if it did truly represent the voice of its people, it would act in very different ways as a, uh, a power in the region. And that's important for the future of democracy, for the future of environmental sustainability, and also for the future of a very positive, clean, electoral, democratic process throughout the region. Thank you. Our uh, final panelist I'd like to introduce is Wendy Bacon. Uh, Wendy is a professor of, of journalism at UTS and she's one of the top investigative journalists I think in this country and has been a winner of the Walkley, Walkley Award. I mean, talking about turning on the lights and, uh, you know, and, and the whole world watching, uh, I think Wendy is going to be a big part of this. Um, thank you very much, um, Peter. Um, it's a, um, a privilege to be invited here today and I certainly uh, don't speak as any expert on Malaysia. I agree with what all the other panellists have said. I'm in the embarrassing position of only having visited uh, the Malaysian airport. Uh, not because I got through thrown out but because I was in transit. But the more I know about Malaysia, actually the more I want to go there. Uh, my own knowledge of Malaysia really uh, goes back to my earlier student days when I was uh, right back in the 1960s when I first met uh, Malaysian students in Australia, some of whom did stay on in Australia, some of whom went back to Malaysia. So, you know, Malaysia has always been very, you know, as part of my consciousness, Malaysians in Australia and Malaysia itself. There are two issues, though, that I would say uh, connect with what we're talking about here today, and both of them. <laughs> Uh, require uh, free and fair and transparent elections of the sort described so eloquently by William. Uh, the first is, um, I speak as a, well first of all, I, before I say that I'd like to say even though I haven't been to Malaysia, I actually don't think that matters. Uh, particularly uh, today when I can sit here and listen to a speaker uh, right from the grassroots speaking directly for Malaysia and as a citizen of the world I have an obligation to form a view. I am an internationalist and I believe that we will never see democracy in many places of the world unless people actually act as global citizens and not just see things in narrow national terms and the whole idea that one does not have a right to speak up about what's going on in another country is really an absurd notion that I've heard uh, uh, some politicians from Malaysia say. So there's two issues for me. Um, one is freedom of expression. Uh, this is an issue that cannot be fixed in Malaysia until there are free and fair elections and a democratic government in Australia. Actually, some of my knowledge of this goes back to when I first met William, which is probably now quite a few years ago, but because I'm a journalist, I knew about that before. Um, Malaysia does not rank well in freedom of expression, partly because 
uh, there is still a situation, even though there's been a little bit of reform, where you still have to get a licence to publish a newspaper in Malaysia. Now, that is really one of the marks of lack of freedom in a country, if you actually can't just start up a publication. So there has been some improvement, but there's a long way to go. Now, there's obviously been a massive amount of development of, of the internet in Malaysia, and some of that actually, from my knowledge, came from the actions of Malaysians outside Malaysia in the early days of the internet. In fact, absolute forerunners of development. You know, when, when I was first getting knowing as a journalism educator about the internet, it was partly from Malaysians that I was learning it. So our freedom of expression, there will be no freedom of expression in Malaysia until there can be uh, proper media law reform. The second one is because um, recently, through actually Peter put me in touch with um, the LAMP um, Linus issue, in Malaysia. Now, I don't want to go into that today to say I've got a long history as an environmentalist and we cannot have sustainable development unless we have citizens involved and that involves laws that allow for consultation, proper involvement in planning. One only has to look at the Linus issue for about five minutes as a journalist to know that there is something very suspicious about that indeed. And, and one of those things is that approval for the mine, or for the plant, went through uh, a state and local government within days of each other and without any proper uh, time allowed. This is quite apart from the more recent issues without any proper time allowed for scrutiny of that plant. So there is a lack of democracy for, the, um, for uh, citizens to become involved in the environment in Malaysia and that in turn goes back to the situation of the government and the lack of democracy generally in Malaysia. So you know, they're, they're my two issues that, that have brought me here today and you know, the general issue that we need to support democracy in every country around the world. I'm very disappointed but not totally surprised in the attitude of the Australian government. I read this morning uh, the ex-Prime Minister of Malaysia uh, actually himself saying that, that he didn't agree with democracy in Malaysia and yet we have our own foreign minister saying it's a mature democracy. I mean, that is just hypocritical. Uh, I thought it was a joke uh, that Senator Xenophon was thrown out and I think he's put his finger on it very well that, you know, just really it completely coming cut from Bob, uh, Coming from Bob Kash, we shouldn't be surprised. Mm. No, no, I agree. Let's get into the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now is the time for audience participation, and the, the rules of the of the game are very simple. <coughs> Try and keep your questions uh, as short and concise as possible. Uh, you can direct them to all the members of the panel, which includes Dr. Gambiga or you can direct them to a specific person. Uh, I will try and keep a call list, so just indicate with your hand and I'll try and keep you, uh, uh, um, uh, get, take you in order. Uh, the panelists can also, they, 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 they're, the democratic rules here, they can ask questions to each other. Okay, so who's first? Over there. Wouldn't you, uh, for the panel generally, and Senator Xenophon specifically, wouldn't you like to see it's an insult for this country, Australia, for the Senator Xenophon, a respected member of the government of the Commonwealth to be thrown out, birds to be thrown out of the out of uh, Malaysia. Now, shall we take a, another couple of questions and then go to the panel? Yes, Krishnan over there. Uh, well, I think I was going to put a question to you to start with, but I think I'll throw it open to the panel as well. Um, I should assure no. you that. Uh, Prime Minister past or current leaders, political leaders in Malaysia are not here present with us and you are a most welcome guest. Um, now the question, before I put the question, globalization of capital, I don't think there's too many people in the room here that will have a strong argument against what's been taking place, which is globalization of capital. Now that is virtually a demand by countries like Australia on third world countries in terms of free trade agreements, right? However, globalization of democracy, the same parties 
are not willing to participate in. Right? So they're willing to globalize and demand the globalization of capital, but not democracy. The question that I have to put to the panel and Ambiga is this. How do you see the diaspora? Now, we have worked in terms of supporting the action that's taking place at home <coughs> via the um, Go Home to Vote campaign and the campaign uh, for postal voting. Do you see us being able to do more than that because of our, or the privilege of our physical location, that we can use that to some advantage, i.e. by engaging with institutions, say for example in Australia, church groups, trade unions, political parties, uh, the, the civil rights groups, to try and get information out to them so we can get support from them to put pressure on the likes of Bob Carr not to be able to come up, come with glib answers like we have a robust democracy in Malaysia. Okay, so we will take this as two questions. They're a bit directed uh, more broadly. Uh, that was very close to uh, uh, a comment. <laughs> uh, I, did you hear both of them? I heard the second one. I, I, the first one wasn't clear. The first one was, uh, I think, questioning the Australian government's uh, role in, in, in this whole matter. Um, All right. So you get first go, I think, because you are in the, in the time, right. time shot, and then we'll move to the other panels. OK, okay deal first with of all. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Nick. Um, hi, hi, William. Um, who else was there? Jeremy and Wendy. Hi. hi. Uh, I was very pleased to hear what you had to say. The first thing I would deal with actually is uh, the deportation of Nick. Now, um, I'm not sure how you can say we have a robust democracy when someone's just been deported for having an opinion. Uh, that's basically what's taken place. Now, very recently after that, uh, Nick, you're not, you're not alone. An activist from Taiwan was also deported, was not allowed into the country. Uh, and she was an environmentalist, so I, I, uh, there was a problem there. So how, and this is happening, you know, in, in the space of the last two, three weeks. And it's all in the run up to the elections, there's no doubt about that. So how the um, minister could say we have a robust democracy is beyond me completely. But more above and beyond that, if he says that he's, they cannot interfere, then they should make no comment at all. They shouldn't be praising this democracy either or running it down. But he took, he, he, he uh, uh, used that opportunity to say we have a robust democracy. My quarrel with that also is that it completely undermines all the work of people who have been working for years and years, putting lives on the line, for goodness sakes. Uh, to fight for a better Malaysia. And that's my quarrel with it. And I can tell you I've lodged a verbal complaint with the High Commissioner here over that statement. Now, that's one. On the second question, I would say that... Um, uh, oh, yes, and by the way, I mean, th there's not enough outrage, uh, Nick, over your deportation by the Australian government, quite frankly. I'm a bit shocked by that. Uh, you are a citizen, and I, I, can't, I can't understand, and a member of parliament. So I still fail to see what the, the reason for that is. Well, actually, I do know what the reason for that is, but it, it doesn't make sense. But I thank all of you, actually, for showing support for the uh, pro-democracy movement at home. Now, the second question was about the, globe, the movement, what I would call global Bursay. And let me tell you, it is, um, that's why Bursay has been so unique, actually, because it's not just a movement at home. It is a global movement, and I haven't seen anything quite like it myself. Um, and it gives us a lot of strength. The global movement gives us a lot of strength. And you, you've been helping by your advocacy work, and I urge you to continue to do that, like sessions like this. And when you write for the local press, you write articles. When, it, when things come out in the press overseas, it does create an impact for, uh, in, in, for the Malaysian government. So that's what I would encourage you to continue doing, actually. Just do what you've been doing and do it a little bit more because we're very close to the elections. Thank you. <laughs> so we would 
like to start first from the, from the rest of the panel. Can, can I just follow what Ambega said? I think it's very, uh, and I should, I should have mentioned in my opening remarks that last year I was in Malaysia from uh, the 25th to 29th of April. Um, I was an observer, not a participant, in the rally uh, that occurred on the uh, 28th of April when the tear gas was used. And I'm, you know, can I tell you, for those of you who've never been tear gas, it does help clear the sinuses, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like nothing else. Uh, and Vegas nodding because she's, she's popped tear gas quite a few times. Um, that report, and, and there was a fellow Australian there, um, Associate Professor Clinton Fernandez from the University of New South Wales based in Canberra, the Defence Force Academy. Uh, Clinton is uh, one of Australia's great academics in international relations. We, he, was, he was a driving force behind this report. It's a very considered report and I can send you copies. Uh, it had representatives from the Philippines, Germany, uh, Indonesia, India and Pakistan uh, on it. And basically it was it expressed the concerns that Ambiga has expressed today. I think the one thing that we've got to take away from this meeting today, and for all of us who've got, I think we've got an obligation to do so, is we cannot let Foreign Minister Carr or the Australian Government or the opposition say that Malaysia is a mature or robust democracy because that is a lie. I mean, it, it, democracy in Malaysia, from my observations, is that it's a David Copperfield democracy. Democracy. It's an illusion of a democracy. Uh, it's an illusion of sacked. And I think that the very points that and Bega has raised today, we've got to take with us and build on that, whether it's in the media, opinion pieces, letters to the editor, ask questions in the parliament. We've, we cannot let the Malaysian government get away with uh, legitimacy if the elections will, as we fear, will be stolen. And that's why we need to liaise with Ambega about this. Uh, we have to deny them the legitimacy on the basis uh, of what clear, you know, clear, you know, what is it in slang or a bigger, what 28% uh, of the voters cannot be accounted for, and that's based on the slang or state government. So, if that isn't a warning sign that something is very rotten uh, with Malaysian democracy, I don't know what else is. Anybody else on the panel like to respond to those first two questions? I'd just like to add um, uh, one thing to what Nick said, which I totally agree with, but you mentioned the um, media here in Australia and, and um, I think yes the focus should be on a car's uh, comment which I think is appalling. Of course it is an affront to our parliament <laughs> and our democracy that uh, Senator Xenophon was uh, ejected from Malaysia but I think now um, car's comment is, is sort of the thing to focus on and, and I'm disappointed in the Australian media. I think that we all need to in the next uh, coming weeks really try to um, and I know everybody here is doing that, but to generate this as a media issue and really try to hold CAR to account through our own media. Uh, that is one thing we can do, and also to engage at an international level <coughs> using social media and our own independent media to promote this as an issue internationally and the disappointment with the Australian government for failing to see these very obvious flaws in the Malaysian electoral system. Yes, I'd just like to add what Wendy was uh, saying about the Australian media here. And uh, this goes back to the last Bursay rally in Kuala Lumpur when, um, in the lead-up, uh, its organisers faced all sorts of threats um, and uh, it was all over really a patch of grass referred to as Madeka Square in the centre of Kuala Lumpur. It's a symbolic place because that's where the independence flag was raised. And uh, the rally organizers were told in no uncertain terms that they were not allowed to go there. Now, all of this was getting very, very little attention in the Australian media. And somebody said to me, it would really be a shame if Malaysia only makes the headlines in Australia when blood is shed. And uh, that's what's very unfortunate, I think, here uh, about the media approach to Malaysia. Um, Senator Xenophon's detention and eventual deportation was a sexy story. Um, the Sulu uprising in Sabah, that's a sexy story because it's got blood, it's got drama, it's got this and it's got that. But a fight for democracy, a fight to rid a country of a corrupt um, electoral system, it's just not making any headway 
with the media, except in the last few days. And I find that, um, as a journalist who's worked here for a few years, I find that very disappointing. Jamie, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Just very briefly on Medeca Square, I went down to Medeca Square with a few of us on the Friday night when the rally was supposed to be held uh, originally before it was moved to the stadium. And there were hundreds and hundreds of police everywhere and we went to the entrance and said, oh, can we come in? They said, oh, we're sorry, sir, um, uh, we're doing renovations. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, uh, and, uh, and so all the high-ranking people say, yes, we're renovating. I said, that's a lot of police to renovate the square. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but that point aside, it shows you the absurdity of their attempts to uh, ensure that people cannot express their voice. That's just absurd. And just on the gentleman's question about uh, globalisation, well, you're right. Uh, capital is global, but labour certainly isn't, and nor is democracy. And that takes us to one of the great suspicions that we have why the Australian government is so compliant when it comes to Malaysia. And that's because not only do they want them to process rare earth materials there with all the risks, but they want to process people who the Australian government feel it's inconvenient to process here in Australia. And the relationship with Malaysia is something which uh, there's been a lot written about, uh, is important to this current government because they feel like they need to be able to dump people on Malaysia uh, so that the Malaysian government can deal with that problem. And, and from my perspective, it seems unbelievable that the government came out so uh, softly or so, um, so almost ridiculed uh, the questions about around Malaysian democracy, and, and my fear is that it is related to that uh, people swap, so-called people swap deal. Thank you, Jamie. If they were doing uh, democratic renovations, we would be happy. We have two people have indicated uh, earlier around. I'll ask them. They're both our blokes. I'd like to remind people. Yesterday was International Women's Day, so uh, <laughs> empowerment of the people who hold up half the sky. Actually, they hold up more than half. They are half the people, but they hold up more than load in the society. So the gentleman just behind the, the pillar, please. Yes, you. Can you speak loudly? So I speak softly, so you've got to listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is to the senator and Jamie, to Nick and Jamie. Is there a sentiment... We can repeat it, though. We'll repeat it. You can repeat the question. Yeah. Is there a sentiment within... Um, the state legislature and, say, the Senate um, that is pro-Malaysian, like behind the scenes, the, like the back benches, and, or are they similar to the media, largely ignorant of the real? Well, so, so, if I can repeat the question, the question is, what is, well, obviously, Jamie can speak for the New South Wales Parliament, but federally, is there a sentiment that is pro-Malaysia? Well. I think there's a sentiment within the government that is pro UMNO. Uh, it's been put to me that, you know, the Malaysian government is only moderately corrupt. I don't know what moderately corrupt means. <laughs> it's not maturely corrupt, just moderately corrupt. Half pregnant. Half pregnant, that's right. So it's moderately corrupt. Um, I, think there's, I think what Bob Carr is reflecting, and, and I, I had high hopes when Bob Carr was elected as Foreign Minister, uh, when he was uh, appointed Foreign Minister, but maybe I'm naive. Um, was this. His view is that there's a strong bilateral relationship between Malaysia and Australia. He doesn't want to do anything to upset that. I'm sure that the people swap deal has something to do uh, with that. Uh, we've signed a free trade agreement. Uh, there'd be a lot of investment between the two countries. They don't want to rock the boat. Uh, but I think the Australian government is on the wrong side of history and we need to hold the opposition to account on this as well. Um, so. So basically, the problem is this. The official government position is one of let's not rock the boat. Uh, but I think that there are an increasing number of, of there, there are a number of members of parliament on both sides who have spoken to me privately who are quite concerned about the role of the government and their political parties on this. So I think we have to get there. But, but the very facts that, that Ambiga has given us today, we need to get that out there. I, you know, I got criticised saying I haven't spoken out about Cambodia and Vietnam and China. Well, well, I have spoken out about China in the past, but the Australian government doesn't pretend that the government of Cambodia or Vietnam or China is some form of mature democracy. That's the difference, and that's the illusion that we have to strip apart. So I think we've got to work with Ambiga and civil society groups in Malaysia to, to make sure that the Malaysian election and the diaspora here in Australia is not... Uh, is not uh, ignored in the lead-up to the election. 
Yeah, I might just answer that briefly. I think it's about information, as Nick outlined. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim came to the New South Wales Parliament in 2005, and I met him there along with a whole range of other activists and members of Parliament. He talked about the situation in Malaysia. And when people heard that, they were moved. People were moved to think, well, this is something that needs investigation and needs to be looked at. And that constant pressure is really important um, because there are very strong, well-organised forces against what we're trying to promote. And the Linus issue is a good example. When I spoke out about Linus, I had letters and emails and people obviously <coughs> creating fake social media accounts, uh, I, I suspect supported um, by the government, potentially Linus, uh, being critical. And, and there is a, another current as well where when you speak out, you'll try to be silenced and other people try to put different perspectives forward. But uh, the point about rocking the boat is as important in the federal parliament as is in the state. Uh, members that I've spoken to, they say, oh, well, look at how many international students we get from Malaysia here studying in Australia and in New South Wales, and we don't want to cause a problem, not realising that Malaysia isn't one big homogenous pro umno uh, country, that it's a very diverse country. And events like this are an important part of getting that message out, you writing to your own members of parliament, every person here should write to their own member of parliament, getting the facts that we've just heard about the gerrymandering and so on, so we can increase the profile of it. And that's one thing that you can do when you go home today. Uh, we can have 100 people sending letters, making it clear uh, that the, the, the facts are very different to the reality that's presented. Anybody else on the panel on that question? Otherwise, I'll move. There was another gentleman just to the front. Yes, you and then you're next. Uh, yes, yes um, John Dale's name. Uh, the enormity of the abuse of power and social injustice must impact on most conscious Australians. I suppose that excludes Bob Carr. But uh, it was an issue raised by you, Jamie, which is uh, a program of in implementing lots of sunlight to which there will be a predictable cancer in the elite. How can you control? Uh, how can you counter that predictable response? There will be a tendency for Malaysia to go through a Singaporean model, which would cause a lot more pain. Uh, it will be put up as a global model. How, how do you deal with that prevarication that predictably will occur? Should we do a couple of questions? Yes, and uh, down here, next. I think uh, uh, the mob car is not done good job at all, you know, putting Nick Zarasone in such a position. This is good. I think disgraceful for our government here. But I think Nick, you can do something on, maybe in Parliament. You know, Frank Bainarama, you know, the, the big strong man in Fiji, who kicked some of the, 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 the previous government out and then had a control over the government. He didn't shed any blood. But our government here want to get him out of the Commonwealth, reported him. I'm just wondering whether you can put pass a private member's bill to get Malaysia to be, you know, to be put on be a squeeze, saying we require, we require a Commonwealth you know, group to go and supervise the election. Otherwise, how to go out of this Commonwealth of Nations? You know, I think this probably is a, it, it's not very drastic, but I think it's a fair a move. I think they put in a private member's bill in, in Parliament. Maybe the both our party here are not interested, but I think we'll see what happens. I think this this is a fair way of doing it. Look, can I just say there's a mechanism. The, the best mechanism is through through the Parliament, through Question Time, through the Senate estimates, because they they're coming up after the budget. So I want to spend as much time as I can uh, asking <coughs> questions of Bob Carr in relation to this, because presumably the elections would have taken place by then. Um, but you're right. The argument has always been. We're a member of the Commonwealth. Malaysia's a member of the Commonwealth. We're part of the Commonwealth Secretariat. There should be pressure. Bob Carr's argument is, unless we're invited by the Malaysian government, we will do nothing because they have elections there. I mean, that's the fatal flaw is that, but if the elections are rigged, there is no, there is no logic to his argument. So we just have to keep that, you know, keep away, uh, plugging away at that. And also, I want to see Julie Bishop in the next couple of weeks and see uh, what her position will be on this, because I think it's important we, you know, we raise that. But I, I guess things will come to a head once the elections are called, and that is really going to be a, a time to crystallise what Australia's attitude should be. But, but you're right, there's, there's various mechanisms that I'll explore to keep raising this. 
So there was the earlier question about uh, what, what the general sentiments towards Malaysia is in the parliament. Um, well, I think there's an undercurrent of concern, but the official government position seems to be, let's not rock the boat. Uh, huge commercial interests, as, as Jamie has referred to. Uh, but I think, I, I really think that's why we need to keep the, the contact with Ambiga, not just and Ambiga, the role that she has, not just in terms of Australia, but throughout the Commonwealth. And, uh, um, you know, I was talking with Ambiga last year about trying to get her to the Commonwealth Secretariat, but if Dr. Mahadi has his way, he, she won't be able to get back into her own country. But, uh, <laughs> so I think that's, we, we're just, now's the time to put the pressure up, and Australia has a leadership role uh, in conjunction with our Malaysian friends in civil society. Could I just jump in? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Nick, I'm not sure whether um, uh, Australia is a member of the Inter-Parliamentary Union. Is yes, they, we, yes uh, we are. All right. Because they have a code of conduct for elections. So if the... If you, and we are members, by the way. Malaysia is a member. So I'm wondering whether you could do something through that. Uh, some kind of resolution in relation to a code of conduct for our elections or something. But I, I, I haven't looked into that in great detail, but uh, perhaps you could consider that? Yep, and I think yep. when I get to Canberra on Tuesday, you might be, I might be pestering you with a phone call. <laughs> no problem, okay. no problem. <laughs> Can I jump in here yes, to please, really throw in something that I, that I think um, perhaps Ambiga might be able to address from Kuala Lumpur? Uh, and it has to do with both Jamie and uh, Nick referring to the Australian government's sentiment and describing it as, let's not rock the boat. Um, well, I think we need to look a bit further ahead because the boat could very well sink. Um, we are all very concerned with uh, the possible aftermath of uh, the 13th general election. Um, and perhaps some bigger, you could, you could um, project some of your views about you know, the various scenarios uh, that have been canvassed um, among NGOs uh, once the result is known, no matter who wins. So that's a question from William to you, Ambiga. I just want to add one small bit to it. Do you think this crisis in Sabah could possibly be used to defer the elections or cancel them or something? Okay, um, you know, when I several months ago when people asked me about possibility of emergency, that's the only way in which you can postpone the elections because it suspends the constitution. I said, I, I laughed at it and said, no, no way they would do that. But the situation in Sabah is, has given rise uh, to some concern, but I don't think they're gonna use that to postpone the elections. What they might do is to stall the elections in those areas. That's what they've said so far. Uh, because if they postpone the elections, I think that would go down very badly for the Barisan. They can't do it indefinitely. Um, but as far as the scenarios, uh, uh, the possible scenarios, well, I don't think, um, I personally don't think there's going to be any trouble as such after the elections, right? Uh, you may get, in certain key areas, you may get people coming out uh, to the streets or whatever it is, uh, if there is a huge amount of cheating in those areas. So it's not something I think that may happen everywhere. But you know, you can't tell. I, I can't predict. I really cannot predict. Because what I can tell you is there is a great level of um, uh, knowledge about the possibility of a fraudulent election. So when people get angry about things like that, you don't know quite how they will react. So um, what were you having, is that what you had in mind, uh, William, as to the yes. possible scenarios? And, yes, yeah. exactly. You know, and the more we talk about it, the more, you see, don't forget, this government has been there 54 years. <laughs> so when the idea that there could be a change of government first came about two, three years ago, they were appalled by it. There's no way they could accept that. Um, but the more we talk about it, the more it's sinking in, the more they are actually responding to say, and this is not the prime minister, but other members of parliament responding to say, look, if there is a change of government, we will hand over peacefully. Right? But what concerns me, William, because they're bully boys, as far as I can tell, they, it is the trouble leading up to the elections. There is political violence that's going on. And actually, that is the one clear example of a flawed, it's a symptom of a terribly flawed system, if, if the minister needed any more evidence. 
Thank you. Now we have time in this section for one more question. Who is the lucky last? <laughs> I think take up his hand went up first. <laughs> um, thank you, Pete. Uh, hello, I'm Biga. It was nice Hi. meeting you. Yeah, uh, Nikhil. Um, one question to you is that, that I know that your Pemantau training, that's the obvious, is going on very well. Um, but the, uh, the, the EC also has its official observers. Now, on that day, wouldn't that be a, a, a conflict uh, in this uh, observe, uh, two types of observers at polling polls? Uh, what, what, what are your comments to that? And also, uh, another general question to uh, uh, Nick and, and Jamie. Both of you are active in, in, in Malaysia. Nick, what, what has happened within last April and recently for them not to allow you in? I mean, obviously something must have triggered off. And as Ambiga mentioned that one lady from Taiwan was barred, then who is next? How do we know who is next on their books for not allowing people uh, to go in? Is, is there a criteria the immigration department or the security uh, 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 people uh, 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 noting that who you know is is is, is next you know on, on on their books? Okay, I think we will squeeze in one more actually from the and then we can listen carefully to this. This last one, John, you had your hand up. Actually, um, <clears throat> the senator kind of stole the thunder of this question and, and bigger answered it in part. But I'd like to know the views of the other panelists. And this is after your detention and deportation, Malaysia allowed a Hamas leader. Now, we all know Hamas is an illegal uh, criminal, you know, uh, classified as a terrorist organization. <coughs> Okay. I'd like to have the views of the other panelists because we heard from Mbiga, she had her view, and so did you. I'd like to hear the views of the other three panelists. And the statement that Bob Carr is a disappointment is got to be the understatement of the year. He has been a disappointment as a yes. premier, he is a disappointment as a foreign minister. Yes. And if he's any comfort to the senator, I will make a small prediction too. He will be out of a job by the end of this year. <laughs> Actually, yeah, Bob, sure. I, I thought Bob Carr was listening, you know. He tried to make it to be his Facebook friend before he became uh, uh, <laughs> He never heard anything back. It's a one way communication. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Last question. Okay. okay, my question is to Amiga. Daniel Olivia, Amiga. Now yes. I have a question to you following the, your race, the, the grief concern regarding the electoral process. Now it, it, it uh, recently has expanded to allow more than a million Malaysians to cast their vote through uh, postal voting. What, uh, how confident are you for the overseas Malaysians to cast their vote through the postal vote? Okay, so this is the last round with the panel. Ambega, you go first. and. Uh, if you can remember those three questions, I have a go, and then we'll go to the others, please. Okay. Uh, for Mantau, which is our citizen observer uh, mission, uh, you, the question was whether we would uh, conflict with the observers who have been appointed by the election commission. When we will not be in conflict, uh, we will be, well, in a sense, we are after the same thing. Um, I know that some of the organizations that, that have been appointed uh, are people that we know, that we trust, so that there will be no conflict. The question is, how much can we see? And I think they are just uh, as uh, you know restricted as we are, uh, because the EC has put some ridiculous conditions on the observers, but they have decided to, to accept them anyway, because it's better to have them there than not have them there. Uh, so that's the first question. Now, on, uh, uh, sorry, Nick, just one further point I wanted to add about your deportation, which people forget, is that after, they, they're using the Bursay rally as one of the reasons to have deported you this time. What people forget is that after the Bursay rally, you came into the country without a problem once. Isn't that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yes. So what happened to that? So they manufactured this reason now 
right? Because it's close to the election. So I think you may want to push that point, uh, Nick. Is okay? You say I'm a danger because of Bursi. Well, why did you let me into the country? In, was it November or November? Sometime November. Now? Yeah, November. yeah. So that's that's one. Then I would also say that uh, the other thing they've forgotten is that we have students. We have many people living in Australia now. What if Australia behaved the way Malaysia did? Okay. Because people are critical, I just heard John being critical of the of, of uh, Bob Carr. What you know? Can the Australian government behave in the same way that the Malaysian government did and say, look, we're we're kicking you out because we don't like you to be critical? They won't. They know they won't. So that that that's why there has to be responsible conduct by the Malaysian government because that conduct can impinge on our citizens overseas. Right. That's that's the other point. Then the final point is on the electoral process, the post to voting. I do have a concern, quite honestly, about the overseas votes, you know. Um, number one, there's no clarity in the procedure. Number two, they it at such a last minute that I, I have my suspicions about it, which is why we are encouraging people to come home and vote as a first priority. But failing that, they should go for the postal votes and we should try and put in as many safeguards as we can. And they've agreed to observe us recently, uh, William, you, you know that. Um, so I, I do have concerns about diplomatic bags. I have concerns about people who post their votes back directly to the uh, commission, that, because you won't have control over that at all. So yes, I still do have concerns about the postal votes. Uh, I'm because before you go, uh, the organizers yes. asked me to ask you an undiplomatic question. Do you have sure. a prediction for the election results? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you it's close. All right, I, I could predict it if it was clean. <laughs> if it was clean and fair. Please do, please do. No, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> Let's put it this way. At this point, it's pretty close. It's close. It's a. It's going to be a good fight. Really? And it, it's a pity it, it won't be a clean fight. Because we could actually enjoy these elections if they were. Please answer Thank when, you. When, when so do okay. she predicts the election will be? Oh, yeah, it's election day. That's the other prediction. These people, are, you know, they're betting people, I think. <laughs> they can bet on what day they will be, what they will not be. You know? What do you I think did, about the day? Okay, last year I, I took a bet with someone and I said it will not be last year, and I won. Um, and, and I think I'll win if I say it's not going to be this month. It is, I, look, I've given up predicting. All I know is, the certainty is that if the elections are not called by the 28th of April, it dissolves, Parliament dissolves automatically. That's the only certainty we have. Uh, because, you know, it's such a move, a move. These things are developing on a daily basis. And I think this Prime Minister is just not able to make the decision when to dissolve Parliament. Yeah. So, okay, this is the last round. Uh, so, the, I'm going to go in the reverse order. So, Wendy goes first. Um, I'd like to say something about the um, border situation and who should be let in and who shouldn't be let in. Look, I don't think it's a very good um, approach to sort of say, look, uh, if Senator Xenophon wasn't allowed in, well, why should you allow Hamas in? I, I don't think that's very productive. I actually think it is better to support um, a really open approach to who can come into a country and speak. We've recently had Geert Wilders in Australia. He, he was here to inspire hatred. Um, he is not someone that I imagine um, many people in this room would, or if anybody in this room would have any time for at all. And yet I think at the end of the day, he came here People protested against what he had to say, and he went away, and I don't actually think huge damage was done by his visit. Now, if any, if anyone I can think of, I might have said, why let him into the country? I, you know, I think it was a better decision to let him into the country. So I think rather than sort of saying, Malaysia should have, shouldn't let this person in, they should let this one, we should just, part of democracy is actually people being able to go into a country like Nick Zernicon and go in there and talk about the electoral system of Malaysia. I mean, that is democracy. Jamie? Um, I just made my notes on my phone, and so I just have to turn it back on again. Um, I think the issue which is important, and I know that we've been a lot of criticism of Bob Carr, and I don't want to get party political, but the coalition is no better. And this is the problem with our democracy. And I think sometimes it's good to criticise ourselves as well, rather than criticise other countries, is in this country, we have one party or the other. 
uh, in Malaysia you have one party or nothing at the moment. Um, and this is something that I think we need to consider because the coalition's position on this is no better than the government's position. And um, uh, the fact that no one from Labor or Liberal is here, there is a Green Party and an Independent, uh, says that we need to expand this discussion into other political parties, into the wider Australian community, so this can become more powerful. Uh, just one final point I'd like to make is, um, in terms of conflicting or, or challenges with lots of election observers, uh, there's so many election observers at elections uh, where there's doubts. I, I remember recently in uh, Timor Leste in the election, there were like 12 different observer groups. And there were more, more observers standing outside the ballot boxes than there were voters half the time. Um, but there is an opportunity to highlight the importance of this matter politically. And I think, and one of the things I would like to do, and I'll speak to Peter about this, let's organise a delegation of Australians. I'll go. We'll get other people to go, to go and be, uh, support the citizens, of, uh, citizens observers. And if we get deported a week before the election, well, that's great news because that demonstrates how scared they are of allowing people to witness their so-called clean process. And if we don't get deported, uh, then we can legitimately report on what we see as the, uh, the functioning uh, positive or negative of the electoral system. So maybe that's a step that we can look at developing a bit of a campaign around that. Join the um, election observers committee, be prepared to drop things at the last minute and get on a plane. But either way, I think it will be something very important. So it may be a bit of a, uh, an organising tool for those of us who are interested in travelling to Malaysia to help observe what I hope will be um, the free and fair election that reflects the will of the people uh, in the way that, it, that, that the government here, at least, claims that it will. Yes, don't forget to take and show your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I won't be there unless I can swim from the causeways. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I could do it. So it's only about, what, it's only a few hundred metres, isn't it? Yeah, I should be able to do it. Did they like tell it. you when they're going to take off their name from the wanted list? Uh, indefinitely, <laughs> Indef indefinitely, and uh, so I'm on the I'm on the uh, secure I'm a security risk apparently. So um, I think that's a very good idea of Jamie's. Um, you know, people like Senator John Williams, a national senator from New South Wales, he was an election an official election observer for the Australian government for the elections in Georgia just last year, last October, November. Um, we need to get as many people from as many different parties as possible. To, to go along. So I wouldn't mind talking to Jamie about that, whether it's state members, preferably federal members, but getting a whole group of people together. Uh, and if they're all deported, then that's so, so be it. But if we can have at least a dozen MPs turning up from all sides of politics, that would be very useful. Uh, unfortunately, I just have to call, help coordinate back home. <laughs> <laughs> and William. Um, I know that we have to move on. Uh, I would just like to say that I take, and I'm sure Bega would agree, a great deal of comfort knowing that we have such support um, from politicians and journalists and academics like Wendy Bacon in Australia. And um, just as we have been trying to say through John Bale Undi to all Malaysians, you are not alone. Um, I think Malaysians back home should hear about this forum because we are not alone with people like Jamie Parker, Nick Xenophone and Wendy Bacon. Thank you very much. Well, before I ask you to, to uh, once again thank the, the panellists here, I have two requests to pass on to you. One is before you leave this place, I mean, we have one more half of the session, the film and the discussion with the directors coming up. Uh, before you leave, uh, we want you to make a little hand-drawn sign, and Adrian is there uh, at the exit, like you saw at the beginning of the film, so we can add to that wonderful collection of photographs. Second thing, um, please make a donation to, to, to uh, John Balikundi, because we want to continue this discussion. I'm sure you would agree it was a very interesting uh, discussion we have had here, but it's far from finished. This is just the beginning. 
So in order for us to continue this discussion and to reach out, as the panelists have said, more broadly uh, into the Australian uh, community to get more support for democracy in Malaysia, uh, we need your financial support. So please be generous also with, with, with donations. Now I'd like you to once again thank our panelists, Ambiga, our uh, secret guest last minute uh, appearance panelists. Thank you very much. And, and, and William, and Nick, and Jamie, and Wendy. Let's give them a big round. Thank you. 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 Thank you.